my water up here, but uh, today we are calling Baptist Church. So. <laughs> you have much talent at this church, uh, but there are a lot of churches that have talent, but praise God, you have people who use the talent for the Lord in this church. And that's a, that's a mighty, mighty good thing. So Mark, thanks for singing. Uh, Janice, thanks for uh, what you do. So much. Um, Brother Clay, thanks for coming. I scared Broadus a bit. This morning he said, uh, we, we talked, we, he, he reminded me you would only take a few minutes. I said, yeah. I said, I'll only be able to preach for 50 minutes this morning. <laughs> for 50 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to have a heart attack right here in the church. I, I promise I won't preach that long. He came down and gave me, uh, Clay did, gave me a card. He uh, donated Bibles. <coughs> I get cards all the time from Gideons. When they meet, um, and, and I don't pick one against the other, but they will send me a card and say they pray for me. And that's a super, super cool thing. And I thank you so much for that. Um, you can give Bibles in honor of someone. Or remember, years ago today, Father passed away. Didn't give Bibles in, but when my parents died, we heard the lesson and we gave Bibles. We stand on the shoulders of the generation that went before us. Amen? And we just need to be, uh, um, we need to be very much about the generation that's coming behind us that we have the firm foundation that they can stand on our shoulders too. Amen? Enough of that. Mark chapter 10. Mark 10. A couple weeks ago, I spoke when Jesus came by and looked at Peter and Andrew and James and John, used a, a life lesson where they found themselves doing the best that they could and found themselves empty. But when Christ came in, God gave them a boatload. God filled them up. But then he, uh, Peter's words were amazing to me. He said, uh, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. But Jesus wasn't interested in that. He said, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be a, a fisher of men. Follow me. And Peter and Andrew and James and John forsook all and followed Christ. Last week we talked about how he went up to, not, not the one in all the priestly robes, but the one that the Jewish people had turned their back on because basically he had turned his back on them, Matthew, Levi. And to them he said the same words, follow me. And he left the money behind, he left those things behind and said, from this time forward, my life will be Christ and be about Him. There's something that's drawing me to God, and I am seeking to follow Him. And praise God for Matthew that forsook all and followed Him. Then Mark saying that today, and I said, you know, you're following my theme, and today, once again, we're going to look at those who, who just simply came to the place and had the calling of God to follow Him, but this one did not. I think it's good to talk about Peter and Andrew and James and John. I think it's good to talk, talk about Matthew. But yet, it would be wrong if we didn't talk about the one who had the opportunity but chose not to. That's just as part of life as the rest. For those of you here today who have a testimony, bless you. For those of you who are wise enough to come to a place and time in your life, to invite Christ to be the Lord and Savior of all. Bless you. You have chosen to uh, uh, give your heart, give your life, to give your service, to give your all unto Him. And your life is the better because of that. Bless you. But the sad thing is that there are many who 
still have not made that decision. Matter of fact, there are some that have made that decision and their answer was no. We have to talk about that as well. So if you have your Bible, look at Mark chapter number 10. Stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. Very familiar passage. Verse number 17. Now as he, that is Jesus, was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what should I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, murder, steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus looked at him and loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. Notice there he didn't say take up my cross. He said the cross. And follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astonished at this word, his words. And Jesus answered and said to him, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day that is, we call it the Lord's Day, but I pray every day is your day. Lord, but we gather together in your name. We sing your praises. We give unto you. Lord, uh, we treasure you. That's why we're here. Lord, we look, look to your word because we find strength as you speak to us through your word. So I pray, Lord, in the next few moments that you would speak personally, cleanly, plainly. But Lord, with meaning, as Mark said, Lord, uh, we know your word will not return forward. Clay said it's going to go all around the world, and I thank you for that. But, Lord, it's here today, and we're responsible for what we hear. So, Lord, as you speak to us personally, may your yes be our yes. And, sir, we'll give you the glory for it. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Mark 10, verse 1, said he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. Multitudes gathered to him again. And as he was accustomed, he taught them again. Seemed like everywhere Jesus went, there were hungry people who wanted to know. And as a matter of fact, on this particular occasion, before the, uh, the verses that follow verse 1, said uh, there was a question that they had, really, there was a meaning behind it. It was really a meaning of division. But he, they brought up divorce and marriage. And what happens and what does God do? So God gave him his truth. And he must have uh, run the veil because there was one there. In this particular account is in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. There was one there that, that had a, a, something missing in his life. And he was looking for it. And he knew it would need to come from God, and, and he saw something in Christ. So the Bible says in verse 17 that he ran to him. Now, in Matthew's account, it said he's a ruler. Luke says he was a rich, young man. We know him as the rich, young ruler. If you look at him, he was probably privileged. He had robes on that let you know that he was a religious kind of guy. And, and probably beautiful robes. But a couple of Wednesday nights ago, we talked about girding up our loins, and I put some thoughts into their heads that probably made them scream when they went to bed that night. But that, those, those long roads, this, they, they would pick them up, get them up so they could run. So this guy probably just had them up, kind of a, holding them up, and he, he's running to where Jesus is. Jesus is just walking down the road. So you, you understand there's something that's compelling you. There's something inside of him, I, I would say burning within him, 
a desire, a hunger, and he doesn't care what anybody else thinks. He wants to get to the feet of the one that he believes can help him. And he runs to Christ and, and, and bows down before him and says, good teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Now, in the grammar here, he, he, he brings up, it's really teacher that is good. He's not saying, you're really a good teacher. He's saying, Rabbi, teacher, that is good. So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good, and that's God. He's really saying, you, you saying, are you seeing God in me? Do you think? He's trying to add the points together. But hear what he says. What is it that I need to do? And that's religion. Religion says, if I do the right things, then God will love me, and God will honor me and bless me and take me to his heaven. So those things are bad. I don't want to do those. These are the things that are good. That's what I need to do in my life. That's religion. That's religion. Can I just tell you God knows everything about you anyway? The Word says He knows your thoughts. The Word says He knows the hairs on your head. There is nothing about you, no action in your past that He didn't see. He is the omnipresent God. He, he doesn't have a past tense. He doesn't have a future tense. He's always in the present tense. So He knows what you've done. He knows what you're going to do. Because He's, he's that kind of a God. He knows it all. But yet he lets us make our choices. So he knew what this guy was. And he said, if I could just find the right thing to do, then I could inherit eternal life. The Jews were very quick to tell you that they were the sons of Abraham, that they were God's chosen people. And they have it because they're a Jew. So we got it. We're good with God. Hey, I don't want to miss out on anything. Though. So as a Jew, as a child of Abraham, what else is it that I need to do? Can I tell you, you can do yourself to death, but you can't do yourself to heaven. God knows your DNA. He gave it to you. God knows his grace. It's there. So if you can't come by what His grace gives, you're never going to get there. You're never going to get there. So He says here, why do you call me good? You know the commandments. And the Ten Commandments, you know, verse, verse 20, He mentions six of them. Adultery, murder, steal, lying, coveting, defrauding, honor your father and mother. I mean, there's five of them there we need to stop, it, right? One we need to do, honor your father and mother. But of the Ten Commandments, four have to do with our relationship with God. Six of them have to do with our relationship with each other. And these are the six that Jesus brings out. Don't tell me what you have with God if I can't see it in your life with others. You tell me you're good with God, but you're mad at somebody else. I'll say start there. Amen? You tell me you and God got this thing figured out, but you're not going to invest in, in others. You're going to live a selfish life that's all about you. You, you don't, if, if you see something that you need, you don't mind taking it because you deserve it anyway. And if you want it, God doesn't want to keep you from having it, so you can just have all those things anyway. Really? Really? That's how you see God. So if somebody ticks you off, you can, vengeance is up to you. Get them back good. I mean, if you can get out of trouble with a lie, just go ahead and tell a lie. Is that what it's about? No. You see, you tell me you practice this religion. Show me that you have a relationship. Can I just pause here to tell you that in a few weeks we're going we're gonna to have Resurrection Sunday. But before Resurrection, he hung on the cross. And understand that that wood was there pointing towards God, but it was also pointing towards others. He died as the Son of God, pointing to heaven, but he also had his arms outstretched, 
the arms that he wants to put his, around us and love us and draw us close, were, were nailed there for us. Even the cross tells us it's about God and it's about others. Amen? He said, you know the commandments. Look in verse number 20. He answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept for my youth. Can I just say this used to tick me off? I used to think, you cocky little fella, you. All these things I've kept for my youth. Yeah, it needs to be taken down. <clears throat> then I actually read the verse and studied it. And read, the word means, all these things I have done my best to observe. I've known these things my whole life. Uh, yeah, I've, I've told some stories, Brother Brandon. Okay, you, you see standing before you a liar. Any other liars in the room? I stole. I have stolen. Started with bubble gum. They shouldn't have put it in the box right there. I mean, it was right there. <laughs> we can always blame somebody else, can't we? I've coveted. I've committed murder in my heart. I scared you there for a second. <laughs> Brother Broadus, I thought y'all did a criminal background check on this guy. <laughs> but I have committed murder in my heart. I've broken all of them. Right? But then, this guy is saying, to the best of my ability. Have you ever had that conversation with God when you say, Lord, I know I'm not everything I'm supposed to be, but... I'm doing the best I can. I'm here to tell you the best you can is not enough. You need what he can give, not what you can do. So he looked at this man, and he, he in verse 21, Jesus looking at him, look at this now, love him. Agape him. He saw value in him. He treasured him. And because he loved him, his, he had compassion toward him, he, he is patient and long-suffering and kind, and he, he says, there's only one thing you lack. As far as I'm concerned, if God looked at me and said, there's only one thing you lack, I'd say, yes! Just one? I would say a million and one. But you can only deal with one thing at a time, right? And I'm here to tell you there's some things that we treasure in our heart more than God. And that's where we need to begin. So he says, go. He says, go. Go your way. Sell whatever you have, give to the poor, you have treasure in heaven. Oh, Lord, the preacher going to talk about money. Well, evidently, Jesus wanted to talk about money, too. But it's not about, but the king of kings and the lord of lords who created all is not worried about what your checkbook has. He's worried if the checkbook has you. He's not worried about possessions, money, it's just a tool. It's, it's not that big a deal, right? But it's, do you have the money or does the money have you? So he uses the word go. That's the same word in the Great Commission when he says, go ye therefore. The word literally means as you go. I used to read this and think he was telling this guy, have a garage sale. And then put all the stuff out there in the yard and just let it, everybody come by and just give everything away. And you own nothing anymore. To be a, a follower of Christ means you have to take a vow of poverty. But that's not what he's saying. He's not saying give everything away and follow me. He's talking about a principle here that I'm going to give full credit. When, when I first heard this, it was from another pastor named Johnny Hunt. He was pastor of First Baptist Church Woodstock. And it applies to this scripture so very well. He calls it the law of the open hand. Y'all listening to me? Y'all got to listen quick. The law of the open hand. God puts things into our life. Church, y'all know what this is, don't you? <laughs> this is church food. 
It fills the the aisles of New Holland Baptist Church every week. Amen. Talking about you, brother. Now, wife, come here. Don't be offended. I call her wife. I know her name. I, I first church I was at, I, I turned around and said, "Wife." I thought the ladies in that church were gonna kill me. I said, "Woman." Well, Jesus called his mama a woman. So y'all are mad at me anyway. Let's get back to the sermon. Yeah. Amen. Now, she took one, but she could have taken them all. Right? And she could put any back one back in if she wanted to, but she didn't want to. You can be seated. <laughs> well, amen. You know, I, I'm noticing a pattern. They'll take, they haven't put anything in the hand yet. We take greenbacks too, brother. <laughs>
I didn't know what it meant to honor my father and mother. All I knew what I was supposed to do was obey. But when I got older, I learned it meant more than obey. And I had spent my last days with my parents, seeking with all of my heart to honor them. The way they took care of me. And I remember March 21st when my dad passed away very well. But I also remember the day in January when I went to the hospital and the doctors took me in the little room beside his room and showed me the MRI of his brain where the tumor was. And he said, there's the brain and there's the tumor. And I said to him, okay, what do we do? He said, what do you mean? I said, what do we do? He said, there's nothing we do. He's got a tumor in his brain. He's going to die. Now, it may sound absolutely ridiculous what I'm about to say, but a peace came over me because it wasn't about me. I gave him to the Lord. And I said, whatever brings you honor and glory and praise is fine with me. It didn't matter that my dad had given, you know, the, the power of attorney for medical reasons. That didn't matter. He was in the Lord's hand. The Lord would provide. And what would be a very traumatic event became a blessed event because I had come to the place in time of learning what it meant to live the life of the open end. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Job taught us, if Job taught us anything, if God takes it away, we will praise him. If God just restores back, we will praise him. He is worthy of our praise beyond our circumstances. So people can't tithe because they've got a closed hand because they can't give it away. I just open it up and say, whatever you want is yours. Use it, my Lord. Use it. But let's not talk about just the treasure. Let's talk about your time. Does it belong to you or does it belong to him? Let's talk about all the things that he's placed in your life. All the talents that are there. All the resources of everything. Your influence. Is it about you or is it about him? If you have the law of the open hand. And when you face the almighty God. You're going to have to make a decision. Look at the decision. <coughs> Go your way. Sell whatever you have. Live with an open hand. Give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come. He says, Go as you go. <coughs> come. Follow me. But when you come, <coughs> you might not like this next part. By the way, it's not me. Don't get mad at me. This is a roadway to heaven. Take a cross. Take a cross. I have a dear friend who left six figures because God put him in the recovery ministry. And he talked to those people, those alcoholics and drug addicts. And he says, You got a choice. Every day you got to take up the cross. Not about you. Not about you. Every day you could go out and, and live for you and use. Or you could pick up that cross and follow him. Why is it that we have to have the cross? Because the cross is the gateway to glory. We would have nothing had it not been for the cross. If the blood had not been spilled. If the life had not been given. Now praise God for resurrection, but you receive what happened on the resurrection after you find the way through the cross. Amen. We just want to bypass the cross and go straight to glory land. No, we got to walk it out. Now, I'm going to glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> No more sickness, no more heartaches, no more pain. Anybody good with that? Amen. 
No more sad goodbyes. Everybody loves everybody. Anybody good with that? We will be in the presence of the Almighty who is all good all the time. Anybody good with that? I'm going to glory one day. And I'm getting a whole lot closer than I used to be. And I don't know how long God's going to give me. I don't, but when I go, I want to go with an open hand and a heart wide open for Him. I want to be about His business. I don't want to be preparing to do His business. I want to be walking it out every day. You come to be disciple, I will give you the ministry. I will give you the Word of God. But it's so that you can live it. So that you can take up your cross. Oh, if, if I could just get everything straightened out, then I could live it. No, you can't. We'll praise Him on the mountaintops, but we grow in the battles. This guy came running to Jesus, falling down before him, because he thought he was going to get a quick trip to heaven. But look what it says in verse number 22. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrow. For he had great possessions. But can I say this? Great possessions had him. If I do this, I'll, I'll lose this. I won't get a new chariot every year. I won't be able to dress like this. I'll have to dress like him. By the way, how much clothes did Jesus have in his closet? What he had on his back. How many houses? <coughs> None that man built. But he had everything that God built. Well, wasn't he worried about food? God provided every day. You see, the one who is the author and the finisher of the faith, the author of salvation, the author of Christ, wasn't worried about those other stuff as long as God was in charge. But this guy had too much to give up. So he ran with excitement to Jesus, but he left. call that the theologian eel. How many of y'all remember Winnie the Pooh? Y'all remember eel? Oh, it's me. Yeah, Lord. I, those people are such a blessing. And y'all know who you, you're thinking of them right now, aren't you? You know exactly who I'm talking about. And you can God didn't create their life to be like that. They just chose it. At this, Jesus said, verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Why is it hard? Don't they have to enter like everybody else? Because they have to give up.
And you know how much of my heart I had to give him? And you know how many times I've taken back part of that since then? I've got to go back to that same place and say, oh Lord, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I pray to give. The disciples got confused. They said, this sounds, this is, this is difficult. He says, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. How many of y'all have had financial troubles before? But you gave it to God. Somehow. You know, I have more. I have found that you can have more with less. And there's some people in this world who have a whole lot and they don't really have anything. I don't want my life to be defined by my bank account. Bill Gates has got so much money, he's just living out trying to give it all away. And it's still not going to make him happy. He's never going to be happy until he finds it Christ alone. Amen. New Hall, I bragged on you at the beginning of the sermon and said, we, are, we have so much power. We have so much in this church. I just want to know how much you're going to give away. Are we going to start living our lives with the open hand? For God to do whatsoever he so chooses. He can put anything in our life that he wants, but he can take out of our life whatever he wants. Amen. Living with an open hand. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the challenge that comes from your word. In your word, the challenge to not put any idol in our life, have nothing in our life that is uh, of a higher priority than you. Our greatest devotion, my Lord, my Savior, must be you. Oh Lord, there are many Christians in this building today, but I pray that they know you as Jehovah Jireh. Not just Savior, but Jehovah Jireh. And Lord, that they would allow you to be Lord of all. That they could begin to live their life with the open hand. Lord, if there's anyone in this room today that does not know you as Savior, speak to them personally. Draw them like you did in my heart. Draw them to yourself. And Lord, may your will and your will alone be done. Lord, salvation is available if they would just receive it. So Lord, help us this day. May your yes be our yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.